Now I will put it offset from the center depending upon the rotation of the tooth. If I'm going to close spaces in an extraction case, I may just tip it up on the distal on the canine and down on the mesial of the second pike cuspid so that I will make sure of paralleling the roots when I get fit. The lower incisor is designed to take more stress side to side than it is front to back. That's the reason why it buckles so easy. That's the reason it crowds up so easily. But in the oriental sample, the inner incisal angle is around 120. But in long faces, it's up around 137. Well, this meant to me then, if we're going to finish with an arch, we should set our objectives when we strap it up. So we developed neutral version to accomplish about 130 inner incisal angle. The pro version gives them all the way down to 122 to 126. The retro version, 135 to 137. Now, if you have a class three that you're treating, and you're trying to bring the roots of the upper incisors forward, so we use the retro version in class threes, as well as the high faces. Normal class one with mesofacial pattern, you can use the neutral version. But in deep bites and brachyfacial patterns, you use the pro version. Because if you don't, you leave those two vertical, they're going to sail by each other. So, rotation, torque, offsets, and angulations are the four things that are built in. So the only thing left is for the height. And the height then is determined by the case. And the standard then is to the uh, marginal ridges. This will take you up to the ideal stage. Now, this will come close to answering your needs, but we have four stages of therapy. One is the commencing. The second then is the continuing, then consolidating, consolidation, and then completion. The first step is to select and place the starting appliance. The second step then is carrying out the intent of the primary appliance. Make sure that you benefit by the transformal principle. Make sure you get your orthopedics. Make sure you unlock the malocclusion. Make sure that you have everything set up for the next stage of treatment. Now, all of this time, we're taking the arches apart. So the continuing phase, then, is in this phase, we have the intramaxillary and the intermaxillary. So now, it may look like it's out of control at this stage. But it's not out of the order that you wanted to move the teeth. Now, explain that to a patient, and they'll understand what you mean. Now, the third thing, third stage is consolidation, starting and putting it back together, and idealism. Now we have to go in and detail what didn't happen with the natural plan or the natural scheme of the appliance. We have to over-treat. We have to set things in motion so that nature can do the final adjusting. And finally then we have to retain. This is all in the completion of the case. Probably even a fifth stage and that is to monitor the case and supervise it in the next ten years until the third molars at least are in or out. But it seems to me as though Japanese have shorter, rounder roots. So the force values that I'm showing may be too big. Too large. In other words, for your population, maybe you even want to cut down on these forces that we're using. So we're going to be talking about now the activating mechanisms, and after that then, how to put these together. Take the lower and mark all the spots where the upper arch would strike it in a normal occlusion. Put what is called the contact stops. Contact stops of the lower against the upper. Where does an ideal fit of the teeth occur? It took me several several months to work this out. 
what I did was to take uh, several cases of normal occlusion and articulate them. Then I took treated cases and articulate them. Then I went back and looked at a lot of my retention cases right when I would finish them. And I was in shock. Because none, a lot of them were not as good as what I had assumed that they would be. The upper central has a marginal ridge that hits right here. The distal marginal ridge hits there. So that's contact one, that's contact two. The upper lateral has a marginal ridge that hits here and hits here. So that's three and four. The upper canine sits in back of the lower canine. It strikes the distal of the lower canine and the mesial of the first premolar. So this is five and six. The first premolar. The lingual cusp sets in the distal fossa of the lower first molar. It has a contact against the mesial of the second premolar and the distal incline here. If it isn't rotated quite proper, or this is to the buckle, you can have a contact on the mesial marginal ridge of the second. So this is an option. Now we go from the lingual to the buckle, and the lingual are the odd numbers. So this would be 7 and 8, 9 and 10. Buckley, it hits here. And Buckley, it hits here. Lingually, it strikes the marginal ridge quite frequently right there. But if it's rotated a little bit, or it's like class 3, you'll have another optional point there. Okay? So this makes now 11. 12, 13, 14. So all you very commonly hear me talk about right here. Contact 14. Here. I've often said that this is the first key to inclusion. Why? Because if you do not get the proper reduction of the malocclusion, the proper rotation of the molars and the proper axial inclination of the molars, you won't be able to obtain this contact. So I said the contact 14 is the first key. Now, let's see where the upper molar sits. The lingual cusp is not in the central fossa, it's in the distal fossa. This tooth sits all the way back here. So the first molar mesial cusp is right there. So there's a contact right there. Then there's a contact right there because the oblique ridge of the upper molar sits right across there. So one, two, three contact. Also on the distal incline of this cusp, you see a contact point. You see a contact point back here, on either here or here. So that's another option. It usually is right here. So, it might bridge across on these two teeth right there. Here's the distal buccal cut. So that makes 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. So that right there is contact 20. So 14 and 20. I know if I don't get these, nothing up here is going to be ideal. Now the second molar sits right here. The ridge hits across there. Usually here and this way there. So it's got four contacts. One optional. So that means 21, 22, 23, 24. So we have 24 contacts in an ideal occlusion, excluding the third molars. Now, the second key to a rickets occlusion is the lower first premolar. Now, why is it a key? It is the key to the canines. 
because it is the target for the distal incline of the upper canine. If that tooth isn't upright enough, and if it isn't buccally placed far enough, the lingual cusp of the upper tooth will strike the distal incline of the buccal cusp. And everybody assumes it's the fault of the lingual cusp of the upper bicuspid because that's where they initiate their grinding in an equilibration. They put the patient's head back in the chair. Of course, that's an abnormal position. That's one of the areas of freedom in a joint. The joint should be free to move around like the head is free to move around. The head should be able to move in all directions. You grind it in, six months later they come back and it slipped back into the position that you from which it started before. Terminal hinge then is no longer acceptable. Even centric relation I don't accept until it's qualified. Now the third key is the upper central. Proper torque on the upper central incisor. The next key then is the canine inclination. And the last key is harmony and arch form. Make sure the buccal widths are proper to each other. When the teeth are right, the occlusion should be efficient, self-cleansing, and self-preserving. We've talked here about vertical positions, rotations, and axial inclinations. So this is what we're talking about here with contact stops. That's an illustration of the orthopedics in the maxilla. This was published in 1960. What I was trying to do at that time with the positioning we had is to show that this changed, this changed, that changed. The maxilla tipped down. The lower molar was intruded. And look for vertical growth of the ramus. Now that was a case of Brody syndrome. This was when nobody believed that uh, cervical traction uh, had any benefit and all it was going to do would be to rotate the mandible back down to Mexico, south side of Chicago. You heard that song? It's the south side of Chicago. Uh, south of the border. <laughs> okay, now the next part here. Let's talk about mechanics. We talk about a lot of physics, uh, technical names. There's only about three or four that I think that we really need to understand. One is elastic lemon. Now, if I have a wire, I can bend it and it will turn and that's its elasticity. Technically, the modulus of elasticity uh, can be figured for any kind of uh, material, bone, muscle, anything. It can be measured for its elastic property, which is a return to its previous state. Now, if I exceed a certain bend, the wire is going to take a permanent set. The point at which it reaches and uh, a permanent set is called the elastic limit or the proportional limit. Elastic there are two other terms that we should know about. The first is the moment, of force. Technically, a moment is a force times the perpendicular distance to its axis. The load with which a wire will withstand a deflection. In other words, before that wire will reach its proportional limit, I can deflect it two centimeters, and at that two centimeter distance, I can measure then what the deflection rate and load is on that wire. How much force does it take to deflect it? Five millimeters, ten millimeters? And what we're after in orthodontics for continuous force are low load deflection rates, which means that it deflect, deflects a long distance with a small load. Now most of the movements that we're going to achieve are within a small narrow limit of, bend, of bending. 
So despite the fact that this blue algaloid looks like it's soft, I've got all kinds of elasticity in this wire. Okay, now what does this mean? This is quite this is quite an important chart. Now, let's look here. I'm going to measure off here 30 millimeters. Now at 30 millimeters, I put a stress on this wire and I can load it 70 grams here before it will take a bend. What's the dis distance between the first molar and the canine, the canine bracket? Now think about it. What's the width of an upper, uh, upper bicuspid? 7.2 What's this one? 6.9 So you've got 18 millimeters here 7 and 6 13, 14 You've got 14 millimeters here How far back is it to the first molar? From the mesial of the tube the Half the, the tube is about half the width of the molar which is 10 so it's about two and a half millimeters, another two and a half. That makes 16. Now how far is it for, to the mesial or to the cuspid bracket on the distal? Another one and a half. So that's about 17 and a half millimeters if the spaces are closed. Now, I've got a a step to make in the wire for a utility section. That adds to the length of the wire, that adds to the spring of it. So, if I take, what did I have, 17, and I add 4, and 4 is 8, that comes up to 25. So, at 25 millimeters, I've got a capacity of intrusion of 80 grams. And I'm going to make a sectional utility. All right? I'm going to come in here and I'm going to take about eight millimeters and bend that up. Then every step that I make in a utility is four millimeters. That's four millimeters high. All right? Now with my old plier, I can take this and measure it with the plier right here because the plier is about eight millimeters wide. That's right. So there's my sectional utility that I can make without even measuring. I've got 17 and a half millimeters. This is going to be the mesial of this molar. So I've got 4, 17, and 4 is 8. So I've got now 25 millimeters of wire between these two teeth. And based on the property of this wire, how much force can I put on it to intrude the upper molar? I've got this up against that, I've got this up against that. So I'm taking my canine and my molar back together. Now, if I want to, to move the molar first, I would make this a little Z-shape. I may add another millimeter on either side. So I'd have 27 millimeters. Now that's the way I would construct a section there for a class 2 section that I'm going to put intermaxillary traction on to get the buccal segment reduced. How much force it disappeared. How much force can I put on an intermaxillary elastic before I would extrude the upper canine. And Keep in mind that there is a horizontal vector, but I'm coming from off the lower arch and up against the front of the upper arch. My tendency is going to be to extrude my canine, but I'm going to try to offset that by intruding the upper canine. But that's fine with me because I want to open up arch space anyway. But I don't worry about tipping an upper molar back too much. In other words, I have the capacity of putting on 80 grams of intruding force with 25 millimeters of blue algaloid wire. Now, over the lifetime of uh, the reduction with intermaxillary elastics, 
I need about 120 grams, theoretically, to move an upper molar back. So I need 120 grams to move an mo uh, upper molar backward, theoretically. So I usually say 150 because you're also moving a canine. Now, so we say we're going to use 150 gram elastic. Elastic with 150 grams. Five ounces. But if we do that, it's going to pull down how much? One third. One third is going to be in the vertical direction. So in order to keep that from extruding, we want to put on a minimum of 50 grams to intrude the tooth. How far are we going to bend this up when we bring it down to put it in the canine? If it's 80 grams of capacity, then we only have to go 8 the total. Do it. So we wouldn't have to bring it all the way up. We'd only have to bring it maybe a centimeter up. So raise it a centimeter and bring it down one centimeter and I've got 50 grams of intruding force. Now that's memorize this chart and your root rating scales. And this is the start of your mechanics course. Progressively as I come down to a shorter distance, supposing that I have a 20 millimeter space, supposing I've taken out teeth and extracted. This is this is an extraction section. The shorter the lever, the stronger the wire. It's a little bit like the diving board in a pool. The long board will give you a lot of spring. The short board doesn't give you much spring. A real springy board will throw you clear out of the pool. It happened to me one time. You know, out in the valley there in, the, in the Los Angeles. The guy had this pool and he had a big board, big long board, so his kids could jump on it. So I had a couple beers, it's a real hot night, and I said, I'm going swimming. The guy says, watch the diving board. He says, yeah, it's a pretty one. <laughs> so here I went, and boom, went up in the air, and I missed the pool. I went out. <laughs> Let me clear, o clear over on the cement. <laughs> I fell down. Fractured two fingers. Got a crease in my head here. <laughs> Had to go and have it all sewn up. <laughs> so I learned a little bit about elasticity. <laughs> now 10 millimeters. Let's suppose in here then that I have a section here that I'm bypassing a bicuspid only. Only about 10 millimeters. I can produce 200 grams of intrusion. I want to intrude a lower incisor. How much space do I have between the brackets? Three millimeters. This means that I could put 600 grams from one tooth to the next with this wire before it would bend. Now look at your chart. How much force do I need to intrude one lower incisor? 20. I can do it 600 from one side. Let's suppose then that I have a lower incisor that I want to intrude a little bit. I've got a bracket on the wrong side and I want to make an adjustment because I put a straight wire and this tooth still too high. It's Friday afternoon and I got a very busy practice and I want to make an adjustment in the wire. So I come in here and I put a depressing bend in both sides of a blue L joy. One millimeter. How much force am I putting on the tooth? 1200 grams. That's over two pounds. With this bloody little soft wire. So what am I likely to do if I do that? with that much force. Is the, is the tooth going to intrude? It'll sclerose and the other two teeth will come. I'll straighten the teeth, but I'm going to bring the other teeth up to it in all probability because I've got too much force. So I took what I'd been using with standard edgewise, cut the forces in half, Cut those in half, and then cut those in half again, to get down to the range 
that I wanted. It took me 10 years. Ten years of clinical practice. Getting lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter and more continuous in order to get down to the range that I wanted. When we figured out the size of the roots and finally got figured what it is we wanted to do. So it was a long, hard process. And uh, I want to share that with you. Looking at this chart in another way, if I take a lever arm of 70, of three, 30 millimeters, at 70 grams, I put 2100 gram millimeters of moment against the tooth. That's the way of measuring a tip back. So this is the art of handling a tweed plier with 16 square wire. Tweed had no idea that I was going to use it like this when he, do, when he developed it. This chart here tells you a gauge, an inch, and a millimeter. Now if you notice here, 16 is a 40 thousandths, or a 0.4 millimeter. You go up here to 36 thousandths, It's 0.9 and a 40 thousandths wire is one millimeter wide. The 45 in the headgear is a millimeter 0.1. And you know how strong these are. So we don't use anything up in here. Maybe a 50 thousandths to put on the front side of a head, uh, the outside of a face bow. Right here, is the, in this range right here is our working range for treatment of teeth. A plain helix, and what I call a back action helix. I'll use an open helix once open more helix. to make it lighter to increase space between two teeth. And I like it to close two millimeter spaces or less. But we use this double delta. You can open and you can, you can adjust vertically. So it's a great integration arch. It's a great consolidation arch. I like that loop very much. The reason I like it is because it's got two helix. It's very light. And you're working with the grain of the wire against the grain of the wire. And you can close three millimeters of space with it, see? So I'll use that sometimes as a little section. I've even used it to retract canines, particularly in a class two case where I've taken the molars back. And I have one, two, three millimeters of space in the buckle. Stick one of those in and open it a millimeter, another millimeter, another millimeter. And it's very kind, very easy. Not bulky.